Uh, Bob Truax really represents the father of the Navy space program and that's primarily because of his, uh, his leadership in developing the uh, JATO, the Navy JATO, uh, in 1942-1943. You know, I always admired uh, Truex when I found out that he was a midshipman at one time, that he was very much in rocket, rocket technology, because at that time there was only a few sort of weirdos like myself, you know, that, that were, you know, thinking about uh, rockets and what they could do. Well, when I think of Bob Truex, I think of uh, an individual who's committed to uh, uh, his ideals and goals and objectives, uh, certainly as it relates to space. Bob was, uh, uh, even in his later years, where I first met him, I didn't know him when he was a, a younger man, uh, but I knew that from uh, uh, the first time I met him in my office right here in this place where we're shooting uh, today, uh, uh, he was determined to, uh, to convince me that his ideas were important in how we uh, lower the cost of access to space, which is an important uh, issue for the nation. Bob uh, was determined then, and I'm sure he's just determined now to uh, uh, continue to advocate for his, his thoughts about uh, how we ought to employ technology and getting to space uh, in a cheaper, faster, uh, better kind of way. When I first met Bob, I thought, he's a heck of a nice guy, but this guy's loony as a tune. <laughs> you know, I mean, launching people into space, you know, there's something wrong there. I mean, NASA's got all the, the money and they've got all the technology, they've got all the engineers, they've got all the, the people they need, you know, to build rockets and launch them and test them and make sure that it's safe, relatively safe, as safe as we can honestly put it. Here's a guy that's going to build it out of scrap parts and then put somebody in it and say, let's launch them. You know, it's a little bit more risky, so you tend to look at this guy as maybe not all the screws are there, you know. But uh, the more I got to talking to him, the more I got to know him, the more I, I found out this guy is pure genius. Captain Robert Truax has truly been the pioneering rocket engineer of the United States Navy and later in the private sector with companies such as Aerojet along with his own firm Truax Engineering. He has developed a large number of revolutionary rocket systems and is well known as being one of the first proponents of low-cost rocket engine and vehicle designs including the idea for a Navy-based ballistic missile submarine fleet. As a teenager, Bob Truax read in various scientific magazines about Robert Goddard's experimentations with liquid-propelled rockets. Bob was inspired to such a degree that it literally shaped and changed his life. Bob Truax started in rocketry about 1932. He would have been, I guess, about 15 years old. He'd been very interested in Tesla coils and large AC generating systems, and he'd been trying to build some of those in his dad's garage. Uh, but somehow he decided that uh, uh, rocketry might be something that would interest him. And uh, as he was finishing high school, he told his dad, uh, you know, I'd like to go to college and become a, an engineer of some kind. And his dad said, fine. Well, when I was 17 or so, Robert Goddard was probably the most famous man in the world in the field of rockets. And where I wrote him a letter, I recall that, and I got back a reply, which is probably in my effect somewhere. It says, uh, Dear Mr. Truax, you know, I am not prepared to discuss the work I have been doing because it's not finished yet, blah, 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 blah. You know, in other words, what he said is, Here's another kid that I got to give the brush to. However, Bob, undeterred and wanting to attend a university where he could further his education in engineering and rocket science, found out that there were military academies where he could essentially get a free college education. So in the mid-1930s Depression era, through his congressman, he was able to get an appointment to go to the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. December 20th, 1937 was when he completed his first liquid propellant rocket engine and really became a rocketeer. Uh, he tested that, it worked. Uh, the following year the midshipman went on a cruise 
And uh, part of that cruise involved a stop in 1938 in England. Well, the British Interplanetary Society had just been formed recently there. And so he took his rocket motor along and demonstrated that to members of the British Interplanetary Society in 1938. Uh, one of the members who was present uh, later became a very famous, uh, very, very famous uh, science fiction writer, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. And, uh, and actually, uh, Clarke and Truax have maintained uh, correspondence and a good friendship uh, ever since that, that time. Robert Truax graduated from the Naval Academy in 1939. After stints on one of the carriers in the early Enterprise fleet and on a surface warfare destroyer, he returned to the Bureau of Aeronautics at the Naval Academy to continue outlining his rocket design plans. When the dark days of World War II came, Bob had the insight to develop rocket systems used for propulsion and design to be employed as a missile, but his ideas were thought to be too avant-garde at the time. Nobody thought a rocket was worth a damn as a weapon or as anything else. And it was very difficult to get money for it or any kind of support. And if you had an insider working for you, uh, then it wasn't so difficult. But nobody else knew anything about rockets and nobody thought they were worth anything. What the Navy felt they needed was a booster rocket for their very heavy patrol bomber flying boat planes called the PBY. The PBY Catalina was, ultimately, what they asked Bob to start working on in the earlier days of the war. That's what they were interested in. They wanted to see if they could develop uh, liquid propellant booster engines, um, rocket-assisted takeoff, but since rockets was a bad term, they called them JATOs, jet-assisted takeoff, uh, uh, to supplement uh, the uh, the. Uh, engines uh, on these heavy PBY aircraft so that they could take off with heavier loads in a shorter distance. So um, as World War II was coming on, uh, about 1942, 41-42, uh, uh, Bob was back there working in the Bureau of Aeronautics lab. Meanwhile, Professor Robert Goddard, who had launched the first liquid propellant rocket ever in the world in the 1920s, had volunteered his services to the war cause and chose to help the Navy. In an ironic twist, Goddard and Truax ended up working side by side to address this challenge, conducting their own independent testing to see which one could develop the successful system. Goddard could not be convinced, no matter how much Truax tried to convince him, to give up on liquid oxygen um, as, as one, of the, uh, one of the propellants. And uh, so Goddard was stuck because what they needed in this JATO was an engine that could be started and stopped, started and stopped. Uh, Truax's team and one of his, uh, one of his uh, officers named Stiff, S-T-I-F-F, -S I don't recall his first name, um, who was a propellant expert, did a lot of research and came up with, uh, with red fuming nitric acid and aniline as propellants. And Tru Truax, when he first tested that engine, uh, said that he would never be able to, to get out of, his, out of his mind the image of Goddard standing in the window watching this engine test as the engine started and stopped, started and stopped. Uh, and Goddard was just there in, in, with his mouth agog and uh, in disbelief. Goddard was, he was not an engineer. He was a professor of physics. And his approach to solving engineering problems was kind of, I thought, kind of backwards. He had, apparently a lot of other people thought the same, and they had encouraged Goddard to get some more engineers on his staff. By the end of the war, Truax developed a remarkable reputation as perhaps the most knowledgeable rocket engineer in the United States, even though he never sought the spotlight. After seeing the destruction caused by Nazi Germany's V-1 and V-2 rockets, only then did the U.S. start to appreciate the value of rocketry. Truex was at the forefront of U.S. military rocket science when the U.S. brought in their biggest prize, in addition to the rocketry program, the chief rocket engineer and designer for Nazi Germany, Werner von Braun. I believe it was uh, the Operation Paperclip that brought von Braun 
and a lot of other German scientists over to the United States right after the war. And uh, I was the first one to uh, having any background in rockets to interview him. <coughs> and I conducted an interview with him and he was so glad to run into somebody who could talk rockets that he opened up to me. But the interrogation of von Braun uh, by Truax and, uh, and a JPL representative and two other Navy Reserve people uh, took place at Fort Bliss on the 4th of March 1946. And uh, they were primarily interested in knowing uh, and hearing from von Braun uh, the specifics of V2 engine development, of uh, propellant, pro different propellant combinations that the Germans had tried, and what von Braun thought of those. Particularly interested in a lot of discussion in that interrogation about the uh, why certain valves, particularly related to turbo pumps, uh, were located where they were and what they did. By that time, the Germany had lost the war, so he had no reluctance to tell me everything he knew. And I was surprised that he didn't know all that much. They had one objective, to build the, the A4, as they call it, the V2. And uh, they didn't do a lot of exploring of side avenues, different propellants, you know, and different ways of starting and stopping and things like that. In fact, Truax asked von Braun why he made a rigid structure on the V2. Von Braun would have been able to reduce the weight and made the rocket simpler if he had used a balloon tank structure, to which von Braun had no response. What's significant was that Truax was suggesting that the exterior skin of the rocket could basically be the same as the skin of the fuel tank. In other words, the V2 had an exterior skin, and then it had tanks inside that skin. But what Truax was suggesting was, well, couldn't you reduce the weight considerably and therefore make the rocket go farther with the same amount of propellant if you were using the exterior skin as the tank as well? Why is that significant? Because uh, about a year later, a guy named uh, Carol Bossert, Charlie Bossert, and Convair were experimenting with the MX-774, which became the model for the Atlas ICBM, and it used exactly that kind of, uh, of technology. Truex continued his experimentations with liquid propellant designs as a naval officer but was often frustrated at the lack of vision from his superiors. As one example, in 1947, Truex came up with a revolutionary idea that subsequently has been called the topping cycle. The topping cycle is very technical, but essentially what it involves is trying to create higher combustion pressures in the rocket engine to add to the thrust power. What about when you refueled it? Was it to keep it upright? Wouldn't the weight of the fuel also bring it over? It would tend to, but it wouldn't be nearly as the Navy didn't want to pursue um, patenting that idea in 1947, uh, and, and they would have had to patent it. Truax couldn't have done so as an individual because he was on active duty. Well, the interesting thing is it could have made him a millionaire several times over, uh, as he's pointed out, because in the space shuttle main engine, that topping cycle concept is exactly what's being used today. Truex was not only ahead of his time in rocket engineering, but his visionary approach to rocketry also affected a wide variety of people as well, just as when Truex was a teenage student reading about Professor Goddard's work. I was just a, a young person in the 50s. In fact, I was at the Naval Academy from 48 to 1950. This was really the beginning of the confrontation uh, with communism, and basically from the Soviet Union. Um, well, of course, uh, in the 1950s, uh, and, and just before that, uh, there was the beginning of the Cold War, uh, and uh, there was this idea of uh, the takeover by communism, uh, you know, throughout the world. Jim Lovell was a Naval, Naval Academy graduate, and I was invited to give a talk on space at the Naval Academy when he was still going there as a midshipman. And apparently my talk was inspiring and it got him all worked up. Uh, and in 1951, I uh, thought that I would write uh, my term paper, which everyone has to write, 
uh, on the development of the liquid fuel rocket engine. And so during that time, I uh, had asked, got in touch with them, and said, look, it, I'm writing this term paper on the, de de the development of liquid fuel rocket. Can you help me? And so I remember going over to his apartment, I think it was, and we sat down and talked for a long time on rocket technology and, and how I could you know, you know, write the term paper. And I do recall at that time he was talking about, and this is 1951 now, he was talking about the uh, uh, developing r rocket launches out to sea, whereby they would be launched out to sea rather than out of uh, off the ground somehow. And uh, so that was my first uh, uh, meeting with uh, 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 Truex. Bob Truex had joined the American Rocket Society in 1936. In 1951, he was awarded the Goddard Prize, or the Goddard uh, Award, uh, which is the most prestigious uh, uh, rocket type award that uh, exists in the country even today. And as part of that award, he was allowed to give a one hour uh, dinner speech. And he decided that he was going to upbraid the, uh, the leadership of the American Rocket Society, which is now the AIAA, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, uh, for not pushing harder for a space program. Yeah, a good bunch of guys here. Yeah. The rousing, inspirational, and motivational, yet scornful speech given by Truax absolutely energized the base of rocket enthusiasts like never before, getting them to take the controls of humanity's destiny in space using rockets. Truex felt that they really needed to do so and that the American Rocket Society should be the leader in that charge, that they should officially form a space flight committee. Because of the powerful appeal of Truex's speech, it literally transformed the entire scientific community, laying the foundation for what we see today in the AIAA. By the mid-50s, the Cold War was in full swing. Truex had by far the most radical and revolutionary idea of the era, one that he ardently wished the U.S. Navy would consider, to equip submarines with ballistic missiles. Well, he had come up with this idea, and, and again, he was at the Bureau of Aeronautics, and, uh, and this was really an independent idea of his. He was not assigned as a Navy officer to work on this, but in his own time and independently, he came up with a proposal uh, for uh, what became essentially the Polaris uh, uh, submarine, ballistic submarine fleet. Uh, in, in, in his proposal, which uh, I believe was developed uh, around 1954, 50, early 55, he had laid out in this report that he developed independently, essentially all the concepts that would be needed uh, for uh, what became the Polaris essentially intermediate range or, or long-range ballistic missiles, but the Polaris was the most unique idea. Unfortunately, the idea of a ballistic missile-equipped submarine fleet was too militant and controversial back then, and no one at the Department of the Navy felt that it was a viable concept. However, the newly created Air Force had a keen eye towards developing long-range ballistic missiles, and they desperately wanted Truax on their team. General Bernard Schriever, who was then in charge of missile development in the U.S. Air Force, had made a personal request to borrow Bob Truex for some of their projects. The chief of the Bureau of Aeronautics, who just coincidentally was the same guy who used to invite me out to his house when I was an ensign in the Bureau, he called me up and he said, Bob, how would you feel about going to work for the Air Force out in, in California? Well, of course, I, I said, I wouldn't like that at all. Uh, no, I obviously was, uh, I said, when do you think the Navy will get interested in ballistic missiles? And the fellow said, I don't think we're ever well. They didn't think they were any good. And so in those early days when Truex was very much interested in rockets and what they could do, a lot of people scoffed at him. Once Truex hooked up with the Air Force at the Western Development Division in 1955, the big ticket item at the time was the development of the brand new Atlas rocket, an intercontinental ballistic missile. General Schriever became concerned because the complex Atlas rocket development actually turned out to be a bigger project than even the development of the atomic bomb in terms of its complexity and its technical difficulty. And so to hedge his bets, Schriever decided uh, that we needed an intermediate range ballistic missile 
that could fill the interim in case problems developed uh, with, with Atlas. And so when, when, when Truax reported to Schriever, Schriever said, your first assignment is going to be this intermediate range ballistic missile, the Thor. He says, you are going to be Mr. TBM. And he handed me a stack of reports about this thick on a tactical ballistic missile, that's what they called it. It was a smaller, shorter range ballistic missile than the intercontinental range one. And he says, uh, get whatever help you need. So this was a new project. Nobody else knew about it or cared about it. And I was top dog, and that was fine with me. Bob put together the Thor uh, uh, Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile Program, and uh, he wrote the request for proposal. He knew the requirements. He knew how important it was to respond to uh, the exact requirements to uh, uh, to be able to launch a uh, launch a rocket and later on uh, uh, develop capabilities. And uh, uh, he took that uh, into the early space programs he was involved in. Uh, Bob Truax was uh, responsible for writing the first system requirements uh, for the Thor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile uh, in 1955 at Western Development Division. Now, the interesting part about Thor is, in addition to being an intermediate range ballistic missile, Thor became the first stage for NASA's later Delta rocket. And so when you hear that a global positioning system satellite today in, in 2007 is launched on a Delta II, the first stage of that Delta II is essentially uh, a copy or, or near derivative of Bob Truax's Thor IRBM. And uh, the Delta II has become the main launch vehicle for the uh, Global Positioning System satellites, uh, which have essentially become a worldwide, uh, uh, absolutely essential global utility. Vandenberg Air Force Base in California is commonly known as the West Coast military version of Cape Canaveral, where all of the spy satellites are launched, as well as a launch base for ICBMs. Truex and a colleague of his chose that site. In the spring of 1956, the satellite program was far enough along that they needed to look at a place where, from the west coast, they could launch into polar orbit the reconnaissance satellites that would become known as Corona. We went down to Los Angeles Airport where there is an Air Force unit of some kind and borrowed an airplane, a B-25. And we went flying up the west coast looking for sites now. We were looking for this, a site from which you could launch a polar uh, rocket that would go in a, over the poles. And they came uh, down to the conclusion that there were really two sites. One was the old Army Camp Cook, and particularly uh, down on, uh, on part of Camp Cook, uh, there was a Navy tracking station, radar uh, tracking station. And the other was uh, near Santa Cruz. And so Truax worked to deal with Freytag that, uh, that they'd be able to, to do Air Force launches from there. Now this was nine months before the Air Force decided to acquire the Army's Camp Cook as a missile launch base for ICBMs. The Air Force was so appreciative of Truax and his efforts that they even offered him a commission as a full colonel if he would transfer to the Air Force. But he tactfully refused and ended his career back at the Naval Academy. Ultimately, the Navy warmed up to the idea of a sea-based ballistic missile fleet, and the current day submarine-based nuclear ballistic missile systems that we see today were born from Bob Truax and his ideas. I think I inspired it because the Navy didn't have anything like it. The Air Force at that time had an intercontinental ballistic missile program going, and the Air For uh, Navy said, we got to have something like that. So they said, uh, all right, we'll call it uh, Polaris program. Truax retired from active service in 1959 and immediately joined the Aerojet Corporation, where he led their advanced development division. Here he developed and tested his revolutionary ideas for the Sea Dragon, or what he fondly called Big Dumb Boosters. 
These were supposed to be very large rockets. On such a grand scale, they were larger than the Saturn V rockets of the Apollo era. That would be cheap to operate for a variety of reasons, including being launched from the water. All of the testing and experiments were successful, but the project was dropped when NASA downsized in the early 1970s. In 1966, Truex left Aerojet to form his own company. Truax Engineering Incorporated, or TEI, where he continued to develop his work on sea-launched rockets and was one of the first rocket engineers to think about privately putting a man into space. Truax even called the daredevil motorcyclist Evil Knievel to see if he'd want to go up in one of Truax's rockets. Later, Knievel sought the help of Truax to build a very special rocket cycle. Way after I had uh, finished my tour in the space program uh, and I was in private industry that time, and I received a call, I think it was from ABC, the, the network, and they said, would you, uh, w would you like to be a moderator uh, to, uh, uh, to a project that Evil Knievel is going to do uh, in Idaho? And I said, well, tell me more about that. And they said, well, Evil Knievel is going to try to jump the Snake River Canyon. He's going to have some sort of a, a system going, uh, and uh, it's going to be a rocket-assisted thing. Well, I was still interested in rockets, even had I retired from NASA. And so essentially I did, and that's when I found out that, that uh, Bob Truex was the engineer uh, that I guess Knievel had hired to have him build a rocket-assisted vehicle. And he came to see me. He said, could you build me a rocket that will jump the Snake River? But anyway, I got there, and uh, uh, the, uh, the network had built a platform, uh, and, and Bob then told me the night before the engineering aspects of this vehicle. Uh, and, uh, and so I watched the thing, and of course, uh, uh, evil, good evil, got out part way, uh, and then I think he he let go of the handle or something like that. And uh, anyway, he came down in a parachute down at the bottom of the canyon. But fortunately, he wasn't killed. Evil was told that on the handle on the right, you pull it back and you hold it, because if you let that thing go, it's going to shoot the parachute canister right off the end of the launch rod. And so when we started doing the countdown, you saw he let go of it. And when he did, it instantly blew that parachute canister right over the launch rod. Now here goes the rocket, you know, the sky cycle flying off the rail with the parachute dragging behind it. And even though it had the parachute on it, there was enough thrust that that rocket car, that sky cycle, made it all the way across the Snake River. But the wind blew it back because the wind was blowing against it. I just want to set the record straight, you know, evil blew it. And he hasn't got the guts to say that he blew it. So. The record is straight. True to his visionary ideas, Bob Truex knew that access to space could not be controlled and owned by one government or one company, like NASA's approach to space appeared to be. He knew back in the 70s that private companies and corporations were going to want their own access to space, especially since Truex saw the potential interest from the common public. to admit that I was interested in rockets because they presented a way to go to the moon and beyond. And this guy said, I've got $100,000 and I will put it in. So I said, now maybe that's a way I could get quite a few guys to ride a rocket. If they'll put up the money, I'll build them a rocket and then I'll shoot them up. And if they're still around, I'll shoot. And if the rocket is still in one piece, I'll shoot them again. And if not, well, I'll say next. Uh, around 19, late 1979, um, we heard that uh, Bob was, uh, we read in the paper that Bob was building a rocket, was going to supposedly launch a private citizen into space. And the government wanted to find out who this Bob guy was first, and to find out if, well, if he can launch a human being into space, he could also launch a warhead and maybe blow up Los Angeles or San Diego. So he told, he told me and my captain to go down there and investigate this guy. So we saw the rocket and we found out that he was as legit as the day is long and that what he was going to do was actually a benefit to the public. So I was going to quit the agency 
And so I waited and I got hired on with Bob as a chase plane pilot. I, I met Bob Truax around 1980. Uh, at that time he was working on the Vokes rocket, which was uh, an early XPRIZE attempt. The idea was to uh, launch a single astronaut 100 kilometers, about 60 miles up. I'd sort of heard about Bob before. Um, I didn't know if he was brilliant or crazy. Uh, um, so I was intrigued and I ended up uh, talking to him and uh, I found out that he was brilliant. Okay, when I came into the program, the name Volt Rocket, it was a way of saying that uh, NASA builds expensive, complex, sophisticated, you know, spacecraft. We didn't have what they had available. We didn't have the money to back us up. But we felt our pressure-fed rocket was just as reliable. The real unknown is the carbon buildup. And so we said, well, like uh, a Cadillac is a rich man's car, a Volkswagen is, is the little man's car. So uh, we per perceived ourselves as the little man's rocketeer type of company. We'd sit for hours and you know, we'd go skid he'd get all the surplus stuff that's laying around everywhere. And he'd pick this up and tell me the history on it and that and that. And we're going to use it and we're going to fix this. We're going to put this together and that. And this is the way it's going to work and this is how it all goes together. And I'm going, okay. <laughs> And it was, uh, it was really a fun time. He was a great educator. He, he was a, a mentor as well as a friend. <laughs> Bob, to me, was a mentor. Uh, he, was, he was not a micromanager in any sense. Once he figured out you were competent, he basically let you go take the ball and run. And I particularly liked that. He was there to, you know, provide course corrections and the likes, but um, I had tons of responsibility. Uh, I handled basically anything that was electronic or avionics. I wrote the, the flight simulation software. Uh, if I said that we needed this and that kind of a gyroscope, um, he said, okay, that's fine. Um, so he was very easy to work with and uh, very easy to learn a lot from. Had a very good philosophy. A lot of times in the shop, and Bob would be working on something, especially these vernier rockets, and can't get, can't really, he couldn't reach in and get things and trying to put things just so, and I'd all the time just reach right in because my hands were so small. But he'd be working on things and I'd, I'd come around with a tool and have it ready for him, and he's got, you're reading my mind. <laughs> so he's, so all the time I was always uh, grabbing things and having it ready for him, like more like a nurse. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun. He used to call me Miss Small Paws because of that. The X3 um, lost funding a month from launch. So we were well ahead of everybody. I mean, nobody ever thought about launching people in space by our pr private enterprise system. And so now we have you know people coming out of the woodwork saying they want to do that X, X prize contest. And uh, next thing you know is everybody wants to build rockets now using surplus parts. It's a good idea. Nobody thought about the history aspect or we're trying to accomplish this for, the, for anything specific. We were just having the fun. Uh, it was just a great thing to be involved in and it, it was more like going to play rather than going to a job and we just, it, it wasn't, no one had thought about history. <laughs> things just become history, but he's, yes. he has done a lot of amazing things and the things that he's invented and the things that are in his head to be invented and a lot of the people that I've met over the past, it's just amazing a lot of the people that he's been in contact with. Those, those CG numbers that you gave, that you gave uh, Pete with the model, you know, for the wind tunnel test, did What that Bob did uh, early on was uh, he tested, he understood the technology, and he tested to make sure that uh, uh, things would work uh, when they needed to. And, and that's important because in our business, uh, uh, the costs and the access to space are, uh, are directly tied to uh, the complexity of, uh, of the operations. And I think Bob's, uh, Bob's approach uh, 
has proven to be uh, the right way to go. Uh, we've seen recently an accident in, in the south uh, uh, west part of the United States where uh, uh, a fledgling company uh, may have cut a corner here and there, and uh, the cumulative results of that are you, you can end up really in trouble, and uh, in this case, a uh, major explosion and, uh, and deaths occur. There was also Defense Department work that was being done by Truax as part of a BMDO study, the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization's research into a way to launch a space-based laser. There was no launch vehicle at that point in time that could carry the weight of a space-based laser. Bob never gave up. Uh, it was four or five whatever years between the Volks rocket and the, the CELAR project. And um, I had sort of given up that uh, he would get more funding or find a way to do it and all of a sudden he found a way to do it so he was very driven uh, if, if you look at the CELAR, you look at the Excalibur, you look at the Volks rocket they're all his same idea from the, the 1950s of the, the simple large dumb rocket uh, it's very very cost effective also the the water launch and water recovery things are the reoccurring theme through all his work Perhaps the greatest irony for a career Navy man like Bob Truax is to end up being recognized by the Air Force for his pioneering work with military rocketry and satellite development. Really, the specific name for it is the Air Force Space and Missile Pioneers Hall of Fame. It's located in Building 1, the Hardinger Building, on Peterson Air Force Base, home of a headquarters Air Force Space Command. The uh, Axel Hall of Fame was established in 1997 as part of the activities here at Peterson Air Force Base to establish and recognize the 50th anniversary of the Air Force. The Hall of Fame actually was an idea developed at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. in 1989 by the National Space Club of Washington, D.C. At that time, they inducted 10 uh, uh, pioneers. All those pioneers were directly or indirectly related to the Air Force. Back in 2002, the name Robert Truex came up to the nominating committee of this Air Force Hall of Fame. And at first, questions arose whether a Navy man could even be considered for such an Air Force honor. And I said, well, maybe a Naval captain there's, might not be the right person for an Air Force Base and Missile Pioneers Hall of Fame. And we talked to General Schriever. He said, oh, you're absolutely wrong, Skip. Uh, and he asked Rick to go talk to Captain Truax. Uh, less than two days later, Rick came into my office and said, not only should he be on, he should have been on earlier. He should have been up on that wall in 1997. We had uh, several of our pioneer uh, every year with the annual uh, pioneers uh, gather together and then we uh, elect new people into the Pioneer Hall of Fame and uh, I sat next to Bob one evening and uh, we recounted some of his times and, uh, and early on and it was interesting to have a Navy, uh, a Navy man in the, uh, in the Air Force business early on and uh, I know from reading some of the things in the history of uh, Bob Truax that uh, you know he uh, he never lost his edge. When Captain Truex showed up for our welcome dinner for Air Force Space and Missile Pioneers Recognition Ceremony in 2003, he brought with him a heavy briefcase. And I quickly found out that his intention was not simply to come here to be recognized, but he was still active in the missile and launch business. He had brought ideas that he wanted to sell to our leadership. I'm not sure he ever got in to see them about that, but that was his intention. And we kept track of the cost of doing it. You know, it turned out to be 7% of the cost of buying a new one. We could reuse the old one. Bob was uh, advocating his, uh, uh, one of his uh, space launch ideas uh, and uh, came to see me and, uh, in his entrepreneurial kind of way uh, to convince me that what, what he was doing in the early days of uh, uh, when we were trying to find a better way to get to space, uh, he was advocating his... Uh, uh, two-stage orbit uh, vehicle and uh, he wanted us to know that uh, he thought this was uh, pretty good and he had the intellectual and, uh, uh, and the scientific background to prove that he could do what he was going to do and so why wouldn't the Air Force uh, you know really uh, really uh, embrace his, uh, his process. In recognition of those accomplishments and many others, Air Force Space Command has selected Captain Robert C. Truax as a recipient of the 2003 Air Force Space and Missile Pioneers Award. Over 75 years after entering the field of rocket building, Bob Truax is still at the forefront of technology and setting records, this time in providing rocket engines for use in a very special rocket car. I got a call from Ken Mason, I believe is what it was originally, saying that uh, there was an individual in Australia 
that has had a career of doing land speed runs. He's the fastest Australian in Australia. At one time, he was the fastest in the world, but the Brits uh, beat his record. So he's the fastest Aussie in Australia. And he wants to build a car that will not only break the land speed record, but he wants to be the first to break the 1,000 mile an hour barrier on land. And there is not a jet engine big enough or powerful enough that can do that. So he came to us because he knows we build rockets and he asked us if we could install a rocket engine into his land speed car. And we said, sure, we could do that. Bob Truax is obviously a, uh, a rocket legend. He's one of the guys that I've been uh, looking at following for many, many years in, in all the aircraft magazines and all the stories. And uh, his history in rocketry is, uh, is legendary. And uh, when we decided to uh, build a very, very powerful car, Bob and his team were obviously the very first people we wanted to talk to. So uh, we came across and had a powwow with Bob and, uh, and um, Don Marshall, Dan Slater and Ken Mason and uh, sat down and talked about the possibility of using one of, uh, one of Bob's motors, a big LR89 uh, with a nozzle cut back put into a car producing 300,000 horsepower with a target speed of 1,000 mile an hour. The rocket engine that was decided on came from a rocket sled. The actual motor was clocked at going 1,500 miles an hour in a matter of seconds, a very short duration. It was run out at Edwards Air Force Base some time ago. With Truax's help, the Australians ended up securing that engine and are currently in the process of derating it and downgrading its force, bringing down the thrust from 150,000 to 80,000 pounds, which is around 300,000 pounds horsepower. We're over here, we've assembled the best team in the world, thanks to Bob Truax and his team. We're putting together a car that's got the potential to, to exceed 1,000 mile an hour on, on land and uh, take the world land speed record uh, beyond the grasp of any other team ever. That to us is the holy grail of land speed racing. So we're very, very excited that we've got Bob Truax behind us. Um, Bob has still got the, uh, the energy, the drive to be able to make our race car reality. And with, his, with Bob and the team, uh, the world land speed record and the thousand mile hour is well within our grasp and uh, very achievable. Truex has been a true visionary in rocket engineering, a pioneer in the privatization of space back in those early days. But now, funding priorities seem to be chipping away at America's leadership core. Well, the government programs are pretty disorganized right now. NASA does not have a clear vision. The government does not have a clear vision. The space shuttle is not doing that well. If you look at 1970, we could put a man on the moon. And in 1990, you know, we could put a man into orbit, and in a few years, we will not be able to even put a man into orbit. We'll have to go to China or Russia to do that. So we keep sliding backwards. We have very poor leadership. I think the best way to get to space is, uh, is going to be a continued uh, issue for uh, this nation. And Bob's push toward uh, commercialization and privatization of uh, uh, of the launch business and ways to help us innovate and create, I think are gonna be key to our uh, future success. My own view is the, this nation does not spend enough on, uh, on being a spacefaring nation, and we need to devote more of our national resource to uh, uh, the innovative and creative things that Bob uh, Truax and others are uh, trying to uh, develop because those kind of breakthroughs will create uh, what we need to really uh, uh, do the best we can in the future in space. I always sort of admired uh, Truex because he, in my view, he was always a, uh, uh, an entrepreneur. I mean, he was sort of a, uh, an offshoot. I mean, he, he didn't march to the, to the typical tune. I mean, he, he always was thinking of something different, uh, something new. He was always a step ahead of everybody else. Uh, and sometimes I think maybe his ideas were a little radical uh, that, uh, that, you know, they probably we never get off the ground, but then again, you know, uh, I was amazed when you know, science uh, caught up with his thinking occasionally, and, uh, and it came out to be true. Bob was way ahead of his time. It was amazing to work with him, to be around him, and watching him work with people, and he just loved everybody. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't something you and me, it was just everybody. He just loved everything that was going on, and all the excitement, the people, but it was a great time for everybody. 
Alright, raise it really slow. Oh, that's not slow. You can see that it fired this time. Last time it was. Yeah, How hot did it get? Bob w was and remains well ahead of his time right now. And if you look in some number of years from now, people will get closer to a lot of his concepts. That's a sounding rocket. Right? Well, could you correct it? If it, it, it hit a wave, it was like this when it launched. Could it correct? Uh, yeah, it corrected because it went straight up. But actually, the sea was rather calm, and it didn't go more than about a degree off the vertical, so it was all of it. People still don't launch free-floating rockets in the ocean, and that's a technology which people should be looking into. Right now, if you launch out of Cape Canaveral, the range infrastructure, at least the numbers I used to know, were about $20 million for the tracking sites and bureaucracy and everything else. If you tow the rocket out in the middle of the ocean, and you can meet your basic goals, and so you don't need that kind of an infrastructure. When you launch out in the middle of the ocean, you don't have to worry about things going wrong in the first 30 seconds like you do at Cape Canaveral, where a rocket can head off into Miami or whatever. So I think what he, what, what Bob designed in the early 1950s, people will come around to yet in the future. And it did it very well. Actually, and we dropped them in the water, retrieved them, and used them over again. Now, I haven't learned a thing in all these years. I still want to drop a space launch vehicle in the water, bring it back. It should be undamaged, and you just dry it off and use it again. Bob Truax, a down-to-earth pioneer of spacefaring endeavors, the true rocket man of the U.S. Navy. His developments have literally shaped the way we live today and the way we stay safe in America. Even now, his ideas, both the concepts from back then and those that are now still being developed and engineered, are driving innovations that will show us the future. Any more questions? Any more comments? Let's go do it. Bob Truax, a man of dreams and vision to become reality. A patriot, a charmer, known for his venturesome spirit, his keen intellect, his depth and personal integrity is an innovator, a creator, like few before him. Bob Truax's vision will potentially affect all of humanity as we venture forth, thrusting away from our planet to explore the worlds that lay beyond. The Truax name will live on in engineering history for generations to come.